going to start off with a, a, a myriad of symbols that we have discovered in archaeology and history that are very related to Christianity in Christmas and Easter, sun god worship and pagan worship today. So we're going to start off with the most obvious one or the most important one, and that is Tammuz and his mother, Semiramis. If you look on your screen, you're going to see Isis and Osiris, or this is Ishtar and Tammuz. Now, some of you may be uh, asking, well, wait a minute, uh, I celebrate Easter. You're talking about Ishtar. Easter is actually the Anglicization of the word Ishtar. In other words, if you say Ishtar in English, it's pronounced Easter. That's how the etymology of that word evolved over time. What I want you to see is I want you to see what's on her head is a crescent moon, and in the center of that crescent moon is the actual sun itself. And so the symbol of power of uh, Isis or Ishtar was the crescent moon holding the sun itself, her deceased husband, Baal, the sun god. And you can see the baby there that is nursing from her breast. Ishtar was known as the goddess of the east, the bare-breasted fertility god of the east, or the sunrise, which is why they had the service at sunrise on Easter morning. Her, her father, excuse me, her husband, uh, on the other hand, was the god of the west, the, the, the setting sun. And so you had the goddess, the wife, Easter, of the sunrise, and then you had her husband, which is the god of the west, on the sunset, covering all day long that the pagan sun gods would rule the earth. Now we're going to move into all the rest of these symbols as we move through these symbols today. Here on your screen you see a pagan carving of the solar deity Baal Hadad depicted as a disc in a crescent. Okay, You can see the, the half moon disc there in the center of your screen with the, with the sun that is cradled inside of it. And that is the sun god as well as the as the crescent moon that, it, that surrounds it. Now, as you see that the main symbol for the sun god was the crescent moon with the sun on the top of it or centered and cradled inside that crescent moon, we now move to something that's a bit controversial but very true historically, is the Catholic Eucharist is actually the sun that is inside of that crescent moon. I'm going to show you some pictures of the actual Eucharist in different positions, and you're going to see that not only is it similar, it's identical. This is where they got the symbols from. You can see here, this is a particular object that holds uh, the Eucharist, and I found this online, and this is what the quote said. I left off the particular church for obvious reasons, but this was their advertisement for a particular Friday. It says, Eucharistic adoration is held on the first Friday of every month for the purpose of honoring and praying to the Blessed Sacrament. Now, I don't know about you, but my Bible says to pray to the Father, our Father. Yeshua, Jesus, said to pray to the Father. He did not say to pray to inanimate objects, whether they represent Him or not. Now, look very carefully at, on the right-hand side, you can see the moon, the crescent moon shaped, holding that sun or that wafer of bread. Here's a close-up of it right here, the crescent moon cradle with the sun-shaped monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church. And now you'll see that it's actually the rays of the sun go all the way around this. They didn't hide it at all. Why did they hi not hide it? Because this is thousands of years old. This comes right out of paganism and sun god worship where it was the symbol of Baal and his wife Ishtar. And right here you can see the pine cone staff is another symbol found in paganism that's connected with the sun god uh, coming out of Egypt, Osiris. It's kind of in a form of a pitchfork, you can see, where the pine cone is in the center. Now, why did they choose a pine cone? Because a pine cone represents fertility. It, it is, comes from the pine tree, which stays green all year round. And so as it, everything began to die in the winter, the pine tree became a symbol of new hope and life and fertility. And you can see that uh, even in Mexico, they found a Mexican god that is holding a pine cone on one hand, pine cones on one hand, and the pine cone tree on the other. Now, what's interesting is the largest pine cone structure in the world can be found in the court of the pine at the Vatican itself. Let me ask a question. Why is a pine cone being found in the court 
of the pine at the Vatican. Why did they choose a pine cone? Why is it that the pine cone can be found on the staff of the Pope himself? Because this staff goes all the way back to ancient sun god worship where it represented power and authority of the gods, you see. And this is a close-up of that staff right here where the pine cone is embedded right in the staff itself. Let's move on to another symbol. This is the symbol of the trident. The trident is a, the devil's pitchfork. It really is a symbol of Satan, of the horns of Satan. It's an ancient satanic and pagan hand gesture called the trident. We find this in archaeology all over the place. Whenever you get into any kind of society of sun god worship, you find the trident everywhere. You see it in ancient Babylon. It was placed in the hands of all the pagan sun gods. Now, all the pagan gods and pharaohs had some sort of trident, a staff, that they would be connected to power and authority of the gods. The most famous one, of course, is Neptune's trident. We call it the devil's pitchfork, and that's where it comes from. It's just not a drawing that someone made up. This has history built into it of where these things come from. Now, if you move forward in time, uh, or, or during the same time period, excuse me, you're going to find another symbol that is even more important. As a matter of fact, you're going to see two symbols in this picture. This is a pagan statue of Jupiter that has been renamed St. Peter. And he's holding up, guess what? The trident symbol. That symbol is a satanic symbol recognizing the power of the gods of the sun. And you'll also see another a symbol in this picture, and that is the halo. Look real carefully. It's not a halo. It's a sunburst. What they put behind the heads of the gods, or the saints, if you will, is not a halo. It is a sunburst rec representing the power of the sun god. And they call this St. Peter in the Vatican, but in reality, history tells us this is the god Jupiter. You also see what is baby Jesus, supposed to be J baby Jesus, is none other than baby Tammuz. And how do we know it's not Jesus? Because you see trident all over the place. You see the trident symbol in the hand of the infant Jesus, along with the tridents coming out of the statue's head. You'll see three tridents, two coming off the sides of the head and one coming off the top of the head. This is not baby Jesus, ladies and gentlemen. This is a pagan sun god, Tammuz, from the story of Baal, Nimrod, and Semiramis ended up being Cupid in today's Valentine's Day. To move to a completely different symbol, here we see a winged serpent guarding King Tut's throne. This winged serpent you're going to see is really a dragon. And throughout folklore and history, we see dragons uh, written uh, in, in ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. And all over the world, you have these winged dragons. And uh, that's a whole other study in itself. But the reality is, is, is the serpent in Scripture has always been connected to Satan himself, Lucifer, the fallen morning angel of light. Who, uh, who in Garden of Eden was, was talked about as a serpent that was sly and deceitful and always breathing the fire of death, if you will, out of his mouth, always looking to seek and devour and destroy God's people. And so I want you to see how this serpent, which in Scripture is, is always connected to uh, a demonic activity or to Satan himself, how it shows up in religious uh, terminology and religious artifacts. Here in the, the Mayan serpent, sun god, Quetzalcoatl is depicted coming from the mouth of a winged dragon, okay? And so the Mayan sun god is coming from the mouth of a winged dragon. Here we have a winged serpent carrying and departed, uh, carrying departed souls to heaven. And uh, if you look at that very carefully, you can see that the, that the departed souls are on the back of this winged serpent. And it's been interpreted that this winged serpent is heading towards heaven and it's taking its, uh, its people with him. I'm going to suggest that it's not heaven that he's going to. Here you see a winged serpent, the very same winged serpent that we see for thousands of years in paganism, uh, on the door handle of St. Mary's Cathedral in, Saint, excuse me, in San Francisco, California. Let me ask a question. What on earth is a serpent, a winged serpent, doing on any kind of religious uh, artifact or building that is supposed to be connected uh, to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior? Here's a winged dragon on a large papal crest in the Vatican Museum. Why is there a winged dragon on the papal crest in Vatican 
Museum, the same winged dragon that we see throughout paganism. Now, the, the winged dragon gets connected and it gets evolves into what's called a crozier or the serpent crozier. Look carefully here at King Tut's a crooked auger or the serpent crozier that's in his hand. It was designed to protect the gods or protect the leadership. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt believed that this winged serpent would protect them. And so they made a crozier out of this winged serpent and they would even be buried with this winged serpent uh, because it was, it, was, it was told that it would protect them in the afterlife. It would give them powers. You see here the Greek goddess Athena is depicted here holding the serpent crozier in her right hand, which is the symbol of power and authority. Here's a Mesopotamian king with the crooked divining staff that represents the, the serpent crozier. On the Roman Catholic serpent crozier of the bishops as well as church officials. So you can see very carefully, if you look carefully, you can see that there is an actual winged serpent that's embedded into that curve of the handle of all the bishops as well as high church Catholic officials. And again, my question is, why is there a winged serpent? The same exact picture that we find in two, three, four thousand year old uh, pagan sun god worship. Same thing that we find all the way back in Egyptian culture of that winged serpent, which we know is Hasatan or Satan. Here's another picture, Roman Catholic serpent crozier of the bishops as well as high church officials. Again, another rendition of the crozier that ends up being a really a serpent's head. Here's a Roman Catholic uh, serpent crozier again in, uh, in, over in Italy. And you can see that it is, again, it's a dragon. It is a, it is a staff that is really the head of a dragon. Here's another a picture of one uh, in a museum of a Catholic bishop or priest, and you can see that the crozier is in his hand. Here we see one of the most incredible pictures of the crozier, the serpent crozier staff here on your right hand side. And if you look carefully, it's actually a king. And out of the king's head is the serpent's neck, the serpent's head, and it wraps around until you see the actual head of the serpent. And what's coming out of the serpent's mouth is the fire of the serpent. And so I don't know about you, ladies and gentlemen, but out of the king's crown of my king is certainly not the demonic serpent that had deceived Adam and Eve of old. But we see that here on virtually every single Roman Catholic crozier as well as Egyptian crozier and all the way down the line. Now, moving to another symbol that we see all throughout paganism is the sunburst or the solar wheel. The sunburst that we saw around the halos, uh, which we'll get to in just a few moments, we see uh, depicted as a solar wheel throughout archaeology. And right here is the ancient Babylonian altar for the sun god Baal, and its main symbol is the eight-pointed star, which can be depicted as two four-point stars, built inside of one another as the solar wheel. We see the same solar wheel sunburst over a Buddhist temple in Thailand. Here is a monastery, uh, St. Ignatius, where the solar wheel or sunburst is depicted in the floor tiles. Now you can see that it starts off from very uh, small and that eight-sided uh, eight solar wheel continues to get larger and larger and larger across that floor and it's nothing other. Now you say, well, that's just a beautiful picture. No, it's not. The, the reason why they chose that solar wheel or that particular pattern is because it is connected to the pagan sun god worship, and that, is, that was what was found on every tiled floor uh, in every single pagan temple to the sun god. And so we see this even today. Here is the face of a child, which is, of course, Tammuz, within the fertility symbol of the sun's rays on a Roman Catholic altar. The same exact symbol is shown uh, in a face of the Babylonian sun god on a pulpit in a Roman Catholic church in Scandinavia. Okay, all this same symbol comes right out of paganism as I've shown. Okay, this is probably one of the most fascinating pictures that I have. Uh, I zoomed in to the Vatican using Google Earth and stopped several miles above and, and look what we discovered is this is the largest solar wheel on earth. This is the court of St. Peter at the Vatican in Rome itself. And, and folks, just so you know that I'm not making this up, 
uh, there is eight quadrants here, exactly the, the number of quadrants that are found in the ancient pagan solar wheels. And you can see the hub there. We're going to zoom in on that hub. I'm going to show you what's inside that hub as well. Uh, but, but let me ask a question. Why are these lines painted if it's not to be a solar wheel? This, this, these artifacts, this building was constructed to be an ancient solar wheel. And, uh, and today in modernism, uh, we know that this is connected to the ancient sun god worship. The sun god, excuse me, the sun disk behind the head of this Roman Catholic statue in Westminster Ca uh, Cathedral in London, where did they get the idea of sun disks behind these saints? Uh, it's because this was what was found on J behind the head of Jupiter and all these sun gods uh, was the actual uh, monstrance of the, of the Roman Catholic Church. That, that halo is not a halo, that is a sun disk and they borrowed it from paganism. We see here behind Krishna, another sun disk behind his head. And this is just to show that it doesn't just happen in Catholicism, that the sun disk predates Catholicism by hundreds, even thousands of years. It was borrowed. We see it in stained glass windows behind all of the Roman Catholic saints, even Mary. And if you look carefully, you see the sacred heart, that sacred heart, even though I don't have time to go into this, even the sacred heart comes right out of paganism. That exact same symbol with the sun disk behind the sacred heart has to do with Baal and Tammuz, the sun gods. And you can see it all over the Roman Catholic Church, and even in other pagan religions across the world. And where do we find this eight-pointed star, this solar wheel, this sun disk today? None other than on top of our Christmas trees. Now, I know all of us have been taught that the star on top of the Christmas tree represents the star of Bethlehem that the kings came in to find baby Jesus. But unfortunately, the star of the ancient pagan sun gods predates the star of the Christmas tree, the star of Bethlehem, by over a thousand years. They were taking the sunburst and connecting it to what you're going to learn in just a few minutes is the tree of Nimrod. And that is where we get our Christmas tree from and the star that we put on top. If you look carefully, you can see there is a tremendous significance and a similarity between the sunburst and the star that we put up there today. Here's the sun disk proudly displayed on top of Christmas trees in, in a mall. Matter of fact, this one doesn't even hide the fact that it's not a star. It's the sun that you're looking at. Even the eight-pointed star on top of the White House Christmas tree for everyone to see is the same eight-point star that you we find in archaeology thousands of years ago connected to pagan sun god worship. This is an incredible quote that I found in my research when trying to make a connection between Ishtar and the eight-pointed star. And in Uruk, a ancient Sumerian city in southern Iraq, 3,000-year-old tablets were discovered where it said that the celestial identity of Ishtar was none other than the eight-pointed star. And you can look up the resource for that on your own. It is amazing to me, ladies and gentlemen, how we have taken all of our traditions that we think that we made up just recently, every single one of them can be traced back to something that someone else did that didn't like our God, that hated our God. The enemy created a faux God and man has stolen all of those traditions and now we're worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the same way that the ancients worshiped their pagan gods. And the million dollar question that we have to answer by the end of this teaching is can we worship God in the same way that the ancient pagans did? And we will answer that question, I promise you. Okay, the word obelisk literally means Baal's shaft or Baal's organ of reproduction. It's almost always placed in the center of a circle, the solar wheel, which represents the female genitalia and the physical sexual act. And so this is why the solar wheel and the obelisk work together in tandem. This is why you see the solar wheel in the Vatican Square. St. Peter's Square, and you see the obelisk that runs right dead center through the hub of that wheel. It's the consummation of that sexual act between the sun god and his wife, Semiramis, or Ishtar, or as we pronounce it in English, Easter. You can see how the two work in tandem together. Before we go any farther and talk about the obelisk, I want to share a story about in Egypt where they say the obelisk came from. It goes back to the ancient Egyptian god Osiris and his wife Isis. 
You see, Ra, the sun god, had five children. And we're going to talk about three of them in just a few moments. Three of them being Osiris, Isis, and his brother Set. Osiris ends up marrying his sister Isis. And Set is his jealous brother. Why? Because Osiris takes over the throne in Egypt and becomes the god or the pharaoh of Egypt. And Isis is, ex or excuse me, Set is a very jealous brother. And so he wants to kill his brother Osiris. And so he develops an incredible plan by throwing a huge party and he makes this beautiful box. And he makes this box in the exact dimensions of his brother Osiris. He somehow finds the dimensions of the shoulders and the head and the length and width of Osiris. And everyone looked at this beautiful box and they desired this box. And so he came up with a very crafty plan and decided to give away the box to anyone that could lay down inside of it and it would fit them. Well, as you can imagine, Osiris laid down in the box. It fit perfectly. And at that moment, he had his servants throw the top on there, nail it down, and they threw him into one of the rivers in Egypt. And he died. Well, this did not set well with his wife, Isis, who took the throne. And so she went on a, qu a quest to find where her deceased husband was in the Nile River. And as she found him to give him a proper burial... Set found out about it, and Set interrupted her journey back to Egypt and took the body without her knowing it, uh, deceived her again, and took the body and cut it into 14 different pieces and spread it throughout all the different cities in Egypt, except for one. The male organ, the reproductive organ of Osiris, he threw into the Nile River, which was then, according to the legend, eaten by the fish. And that was the only organ that she could not find. She found all the different parts of his body, but that was the one part of his body. Now, why is that so important? Because in ancient culture, as you know, even from uh, the stories in Corinth, we know that, that, that they had a thousand male and female prostitutes in Corinth, uh, Corinth alone, that fornication, homosexuality, uh, and, and the like were very prevalent in ancient cultures. Fertility was off the charts most important to them. Sexual promiscuity was far worse than it is even today, if you can imagine that. And so this was really important uh, that she find this uh, reproductive organ of her husband, which represented power and strength, fertility, passing uh, the gene and royalty to the next generation. So because she could not find the male organ of her, her deceased husband, she decided to make a commemorative pillar in Egypt that would stand as a remembrance of his power in the form of a concrete or a stone obelisk. And that obelisk we know from sources is where they believed that the ancient sun god's spirit lived. As we see from the source on your screen there, that they believed that the, the Egyptian obelisk was worshipped as well as the dwelling place of the sun god. And they began to put these obelisks all over the world as she began to do this in commemoration of her deceased husband so that everyone would know that his presence was in that city. And you began to see them pop up all over the place, all over the ancient world. We can see in the Bible, in Hebrew, uh, the word for pillar uh, or idol is kaman, and kaman literally means sun idol or sun pillar. You can see in Isaiah 27, 9, it's used this way. By this, therefore, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged. And this is all the fruit to take away his sin. When he marketh all the stones of the altar as chalk stones that are beaten in sunder, the groves and the images shall not stand up. That word images there is kaman. And that kaman is talking about an obelisk the images or the pillars that they put up in their groves. Here's another word in Hebrew, matzebah. Matzebah, is, it means pillar or monument or idol. It is the erected obelisk is what they're talking about. Exodus 34, 13, but ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Leviticus 26, 1 says, you shall make no idols nor graven image, neither rear you up, a standing image, 
Neither shall you set up an image of stone in your land, talking about the obelisk, to bow down to it, for I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Deuteronomy 7, 5 says, But thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars, break down their images, and cut down their groves, and burn their graven images with fire. And you can see that there is quite a few more scriptures uh, throughout the Bible that talk about the pillars uh, and the obelisk that they set up throughout their land. The great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahweh, he was constantly fighting not against the small uh, gods. He was constantly fighting against their prime god, which was uh, Baal, the sun god. He was always mentioning Baal and Ashtoreth and the sun god of the east and the sun, the sun god of the west. Here is uh, some pictures. We're going to roll through the entire uh, world here. We're going to circle the globe and show you pictures throughout the entire world of these obelisk in, in, in their raw format. And on some of these, as the one that you can see here in Turkey, you can see that the ancient hieroglyphic and their language and pictures are actually still on these obelisk. Here's Cleopatra's needle. Uh, Cleopatra's needle is not uh, just, uh, just a, a neat little emblem. This is a, was erected as a commemoration to the sun god there in London. This is the oldest obelisk in Scotland. This is the oldest obelisk in Switzerland, you can see. In Germany, in Paris, France, this one's covered with Egyptian hieroglyphics all talking about a sun god worship. How about Mecca? It would scare me to death, ladies and gentlemen, to find out that, in, that Islam's, uh, one of their big uh, idols is an obelisk right there, dead center, downtown Mecca. And here, these obelisks we find all over the United States here. How about in Luxor, Egypt, near the Nile River, there is an Egyptian obelisk. This is one of the most famous obelisks in the entire world. It's in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's dedicated to the sun god Ra, who is said to live inside of it. Everyone in that town, in that city, it's been there and knows the history behind uh, that obelisk, knows that and understands that. Here's one in Amsterdam. Here's one in Ethiopia, Mongolia. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to focus on this here for just a moment. And I'm going to show you something that is uh, it really, uh, I only could see this from Google Earth. And uh, it overwhelmed me, and so I wanted to share this with you as well. The largest obelisk in the world, I believe, which is hidden, is uh, what you're seeing right here. If you look carefully, what we are seeing here is we are seeing the male genitalia uh, of Ra, the sun god, or Baal, built into the actual uh, architecture of St. Peter's Square and the entire Vatican a building there. You can see uh, the, the, the testicles at the bottom and then the shaft of that male organ moving up. Now what's interesting is that if we turn this sideways, we're going to see that this uh, architectural obelisk, if you will, is pointing directly due west down to the zero degree. And my question is, why is it facing west? Is because this is the sun god. The sun god is the, he is the god of the sunset of the West. And you see in virtually every pagan society, sun god worship, the altars always face the West because that is where they did their service. And I believe that the enemy uh, had a huge part to play in the architectural of this particular uh, uh, Roman Catholic structure is actually a depiction of, uh, of the male organ of the sun god. That is not a place uh, for an Egyptian uh, obelisk, which represents the male organ of the sun god coming through the genitalia of the solar wheel, should not be in anything that is connected to Jesus, our Lord, whatsoever. But unfortunately, it is in this modern day. The mixture of paganism and Christianity has crept into such a degree that we don't even recognize it because we don't know our history. We don't read the front of the book. Okay, now this is an interesting slide because this particular picture is of a obelisk that's in the court of St. John's Church over there in Rome. And it's actually the Pope's church. It's actually the Cathedral of the Pope. And so I'm just going to read the description of where this particular obelisk came from because it's going to be shocking for you to realize that this was not an obelisk that was just created uh, from concrete in modern-day times. Here, here's this obelisk where it came from. 
The Egyptian obelisk that stands in the square of St. John Lateran is the largest in existence. Originally carved during the reign of Pharaoh Thutmose III, it stood in the temple of Amman in Thebes, sun god, but was removed to Rome by Emperor Constantinus, A.D. 317 to 361, and placed in the Circus Maximus. In 1587, Pope Sixtus V unearthed the fallen, broken, and long-forgotten obelisk and had it repaired and placed in the Piazza S. Giovanni in Laterano. Interestingly enough, it is possible that Moses saw this very obelisk when he was in Egypt. Now, this obelisk, meant to honor the sun gods, stands beside what Catholics call the supreme mother of all churches, the official cathedra of the Bishop of Rome, the Pope. And so we have a literally a three to four thousand year old obelisk built for the sun gods of Egypt now stands at St. Mary's Cathedral. How about the Washington Monument? Is it a monument? It certainly is a monument, but it's not a monument uh, to our God. It's a monument to the sun god. It cannot be a monument to anything other than that. It is not just a piece of architecture, ladies and gentlemen. This is the same exact structure that they built in ancient Egypt for the sun gods, as we've demonstrated thoroughly. Let me ask you a question. Where do we find this main symbol of the sun god today? Where do we find this main symbol of the obelisk? Would it shock you to discover that we find it in our churches? That's right. That's where the, the, the sun god obelisk ended up. It ends up in our churches all around the world. We call them steeples. They're called obelisk in ancient Egypt. If Pharaoh or an ancient Egyptian was alive today, you would, they would walk down the street and they would feel comfortable coming to most of the churches that we have today because they would say, wow, that is my religion. That's something that I can connect to. That is sun god worship. And we see throughout all around the world, here's one that has two uh, pillars that are built into this particular church. Ladies and gentlemen, the obelisk, the sun god uh, worship, there shouldn't be one single symbol anywhere of ancient paganism or Egyptian uh, sun god worship that is found inside of our religious societies today in Christianity. We see it, it doesn't matter what denomination, whether it's Lutheran, whether it's Baptist, whether it's non-denominational, it doesn't matter where you find it, no matter what denomination, you are going to find this obelisk all over the place. Now we come to this same slide that says, but that's not what it means to me, Jim. And I know that many of you are thinking that. And the reality is, is it doesn't matter what it means to us. And that's so difficult for us to comprehend and to get through our hearts and our minds that it only matters what it means to him. Certainly most of us would not wear a necklace that was a satanic symbol. But yet we will, we will build churches with symbols that we don't even know are satanic. Uh, we will have holidays that, su that surround themselves with pagan symbols, and yet because we don't know them, we think it's okay. But the reality is, is that the great God of Isaac, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he knows what those symbols mean. And so from his perspective, he sees those symbols, and it reminds him of when they pass their children through the fire of Molech. It reminds them of the infants that were, that were killed and sacrificed on the altars of Ishtar. It reminds him of all the sun god worship, of all of his, his people that turned their side against Yahweh and served other gods. It's a reminding symbol to him, and for that reason alone, we should put those symbols behind us and get rid of them and burn them like Nehemiah and, uh, and all of the, and Jeremiah and, and the great prophets of old that tore down those high places and they destroyed those pillars. And here they spent their blood uh, in pouring, pouring out their blood and their strength and their children to, to tear down those high places. And here we are building those high places right back up. It doesn't matter what it means to us. It matters what it means to him. And so we need to find out exactly what it means to him. And we're going to do that at the end of this program as we go through some scripture uh, that many of you probably have never read before that are dictating exactly the holidays that we're celebrating today. And we're going to discover whether or not uh, we can actually continue to do these things from our perspective and turn a blind eye to his heart.